This week on In This Studio, we're going to talk about wingtips and countertips and how to position them properly so that when you last the boot, they'll be in the right place. Here I have all the pieces that I'm going to need to make this wingtip, including the almost fitted last. I'm not quite through with it yet, but it's close enough that I can demonstrate. This is my vamp pattern. I use this to cut the tongue on my vamp. And even if your crimp boards or your vamp patterns have a long, long curve and don't have this almost right angle here like mine does, you're still, once you cut the tongue, you're going to have this reference point here. You're know, you know where this is going to sit on the last. And that's what we're looking at. The temptation, and I used to do this all the time when I started building boots, the temptation is when you're trying to position that wingtip, you position the pattern where it's going to sit on the last. But if you're like me, you last the toe of the boot first. When I last a boot, I put the heel of the boot about half, five-eighths of an inch up from the feather line of the last. And then I turn it around and I last the toe in first. Which means at the time that I last in the toe, the vamp is actually sitting down here. This curve, or the break, where the vamp makes the turn and begins to go up the leg is sitting down about almost where the instep is. If you position your wingtip back here where it's going to set finally, let's say that we decided to put the end of the stitching here and put the wingtip here and that looks like it's going to set great. But at the time you last it, suddenly that stitching is over the toe and you've lost almost all your wingtip. That's the secret of positioning a wingtip, is remembering how it's going to be positioned when you begin lasting, instead of thinking about how you want it positioned after you finish lasting. I was just recently speaking to a, a student, and she had worked with another bootmaker, and she was telling me that when they put a wingtip on a boot, this is going to be a little double wingtip, and she said that they would just put the wingtip on and sew it on and then last the boot and leave all of this extra material under here. That's going to make lasting the toe in really difficult. So what I do is once I've drawn on my pattern where the wingtip is going to set, then I cut it off. The next thing I'm going to do to this vamp is mark this line on here and cut this vamp off right there. And that way, once I get the wingtip on, I'll still only have one layer of leather to wipe in around the toe and not two. It's going to make my job so much easier. And I would never use leather for a wingtip that I wouldn't use for a foot. So I'm not going to have any strength issues. This kangaroo would work just fine for a foot, just like this calf would. So there's no problem with cutting away the calf and only having kangaroo at the toe. I'm going to do the same thing here for the counter cover. I don't want to try to be lasting two layers of leather when I'm wiping in that heel. So I've marked where the pattern goes and cut a big hole out of that counter cover so that when I put this wing tip on, I'm only going to be lasting in one layer of leather and not trying to get two layers of leather in there. I want to show you a few new products that I'm carrying and also talk about the products that I carry and why I carry them. I'm not really interested in carrying products that you can get somewhere else. Recently someone said, oh you could bring in Last and you could start selling Last. But Terry and Ephraim Gleck are doing a great job with lasts, so the market doesn't need me in that respect. I'm not interested in selling alls or all halves or lasting jacks. Dick Anderson with Thornapple River Boots is doing a great job at that. What I like to sell are products that I use and I love that are difficult to find. For instance, I just started selling pedographs. I found out that the supplier that I've been recommending has stopped selling pedographs and no longer sells to individuals. I found a source for pedographs and now I'm selling them so that they're available. 
Another thing that I'll be selling is Baker Leather from England. Baker Leather is pit tanned with oak bark and it's wonderful stuff. I just got my shipment on Friday and I have lots of double insole shoulders. I have insole pieces. These are big enough for a pair of insoles. I have welt strips. I cannot wait to try these because I've been having problems with kind of fuzzy edges with welts. And I have outsole pieces. These are sold in pairs and they're big enough for a pair of outsoles. Let me tell you the story of why I decided to carry Baker leather. Last fall I was in Wichita Falls, Texas for the Boot and Saddle Makers Roundup and on one of the days during the seminars we had a panel discussion. I was one of the boot makers up front answering questions and there were several others and then we had a room full of people asking questions. One of the questions was about insoles and where to get good insoles. And when I listened to the questions and to the answers from the other boot makers, I realized that we were all fighting the same problem. We're buying the best leather that we can, we're making the best boots that we can, and we're doing it around horrible insoles because we don't have a good source for insoles here in the U.S. I made a promise that day to everyone in the room that I would contact Baker Leather and see if they would let me be their U.S. dealer. I came home and did that. That was last October and I just got my first shipment on Friday. It took a very long time. It's a complicated process to get an import license. This leather is not cheap. It's very, very high quality leather and I have learned that freight is a huge part of the price in anything you buy. I now know that for a fact. But this leather is the best and the insole is the foundation of a boot or a shoe. Also, inseaming is the most fun part, and it can be like torture when you're working with an insole that's like a rock. I personally use the Baker Leather insoles, and I love them, and I'm looking forward to trying the Baker Leather outsoles. If you'd like to try the Baker Leather insoles and outsoles, give me a call. Sometimes I hear booter shoemakers talk about being self-taught, and today I'm going to tell you how I feel about that. There are two reasons that being self-taught is a problem for me. One is the starting point. Every booter shoemaker that I've ever met who claims that they're self-taught has started by taking apart a pair of factory boots or shoes. What a dismal place to start. As bespoke makers, we don't learn from or compete with factories. They try and fail to compete with us. A bespoke shoe is the real deal and everything else is a poor imitation. Secondly, why would someone try to reinvent a process that already exists? The knowledge, history, and tradition of hundreds of years is available. It may not be inexpensive or easy to obtain, but it is there for those who want it badly enough. I was trained by both Jay Griffith and Ray Dorwart, and Ray Dorwart also learned from Jay. Jay Griffith worked with Archer LaForce, who worked with Gus Blucher, who was a German shoemaker. In this way, I can trace the roots of my boot making back to the European shoemaking tradition. I've made changes to my styles and techniques, but I'm always conscious of building upon an existing foundation. I visualize the craft of boot and shoemaking as a large building. There are many rooms, many techniques and opinions, but it's all founded on a solid foundation of years and years of history, tradition, and knowledge. To be self-taught is like building a little mud hut next to a huge cathedral and expecting the same amount of admiration. I can anticipate the arguments that will be made, and yes, I understand because I've been there. These arguments usually have two points. One, I don't have the time to take a class or go to a school, and two, I don't have the money to take a class or go to a school. Here's the reality to counter those arguments. Quality materials, machinery, and tools are expensive. When you start this process without any knowledge, you will waste money on buying the wrong tools, equipment, and leather, and you'll waste so much time figuring out the process before you even begin to create something vaguely shoe-shaped and wearable. I want everyone who enters this trade to be successful and bring something positive to the craft. The best way to do this is to find a good teacher and learn as much from them as possible.